When most people hear about carbohydrates, they immediately think about nutrition. This makes sense, as carbohydrates are an important source of energy in our bodies, and balancing their uptake and use is important. For us chemists, however, carbohydrates are so much more. Take only the aldohexoses. With their six carbon atoms and four non-anomeric stereocenters, there are already eight diastereomers and their corresponding enantiomers. Each of them can form a furanose or a pyranose form, and those can again be connected to other carbohydrates by each available hydroxyl group. So, by joining only a few monosaccharides, a huge variability is possible. And this is used by biological systems to store and convey information, such, for example, your blood type. Given the huge number of recognition processes in the body, scientists are still working on unraveling this so-called glycocode. And since we are dealing with very small amounts in complex biological mixtures, we don't only need state-of-the-art analytical methods, but also the ability to synthesize these compounds. Nowadays, there are some really cool and even automated methods for joining monosaccharide building blocks together. But for that, you still need the appropriate monosaccharide itself. And that has to have the correct configuration and only one unprotected hydroxyl group. Classically, the synthesis of such underlying monosaccharides relies on ex chiral pool strategies. That means you start with a cheaply available sugar derivative and then start modifying it. But, as can be seen in this very nice example from 2019, isolating one particular hydroxyl group can require quite a bit of synthetic effort. And this is just one solution for one particular carbohydrate and thus one particular problem. So, is there a somewhat more general approach? Some strategies rely on total synthesis. Let me show you just one of the classics here, as it will become important later in the video. Sharpless and co-workers have developed a synthesis of aldohexoses based on the famous Sharpless epoxidation. For that, they start with this monoprotected diol, upon which they perform the epoxidation reaction. The resulting epoxide is opened under basic conditions with thiophenolate. Looking at the product, you might ask yourself, hey, why is the thiophenolate not attacking one of the epoxide carbons? This is because of the so-called pain rearrangement. And this occurs under basic conditions. After deprotonation of the terminal hydroxyl group, an intramolecular SN2 reaction takes place. And this establishes a fast equilibrium between those two epoxides. Now, thiolate has the choice between attacking one of the three secondary or the one primary carbon atom. And obviously it goes for the latter. And the rest of the substrate reacts in a classic curtain hematite fashion to the erythroglycol. In the next step, this erythroglycol is tied up in a ketal and the thioether is oxidized to an aldehyde by a pomary reaction. This involves oxidation to the sulfoxide and subsequent acylation, which is accompanied by deprotonation and 1,2 migration of the acetate. By cleaving the acetate with dibal, the aldehyde can be generated under retention of the erythro configuration. With potassium carbonate, on the other hand, the acetate is also cleaved to release the aldehyde, but reversible enolate formation leads to epimerization and thus formation of the treoglycol. This C4 building block can then be subjected to a Wittig reaction with an electron deficient Wittig reagent, after which reduction gives us a trans configured allylic alcohol again. And this means we can go through the whole process again in order to make any aldohexose you want. So, Sharpless and co-workers have established great control over all these stereocenters. However, when you imagine complete control over the system, you might want to look at a process that more or less assembles the carbohydrate scaffold atom by atom. That way, one wouldn't just be able to control the configuration of each stereocenter, one could also choose the protecting group, which would allow you to address specific oxygen atoms, and one would be able to introduce isotopes nearly at any position.
And especially today, this could be particularly useful in the development of molecular tools that allow for monitoring the fate of a larger carbohydrate within a biological system. Fortunately, there is one reaction which has the potential for doing exactly that. The Metason homologation requires a chiral ester to be reacted with a carbonoid, which is usually generated by deprotonating dichloro or dibromomethane. This leads to an 8 complex which can undergo a zinc mediated 1 2 rearrangement, thus effectively inserting the single carbon atom of the lithiated dichloromethane into the carbon boron bond. And this results in an elongated alpha haloboronic ester. If you are having trouble with the mechanism, that's no problem. Just press pause and check out this other video in which we explain it in much more detail. So, are you back or are you still here? Good. However, there is one mechanistic detail in this whole sequence that is important for us to talk about now. This whole reaction is a race. The reaction of the carbonoid with the free boronic ester has to be faster than its decomposition by alpha elimination. The decomposition, on the other hand, needs to be faster than the 1 2 rearrangement, because otherwise, excess carbonoid would lead to further reaction of the homologation product. So, we are dealing with several finely tuned rates of reaction here. But for our troubles, we get some nicely diastereoselectively formed alpha haloboronates, and those are highly versatile compounds which can be reacted with numerous nucleophiles under substitution of the halogen atom and inversion of this newly formed stereocenter. The nice thing about this reaction is that the resulting boronic ester can then be used for another metazen sequence. When starting from a C1 building block with a masked hydroxyl group, homologation and substitution with a suitable alkoxide delivers a protected glycol motif. So repeating this process should lead to a great sugar precursor. And indeed, this approach has been tried by Mattison and his co-worker Peterson. But they found that while the first three iterations worked quite well, the fourth was giving them huge problems. But before we look at this problem, I want you to recognize something. Two homologations with the same chiral director, each of which is followed by a substitution with an alkoxide, will lead to an erythro configuration. So this strategy will lead to erythro sugars such as ribose or allose. This means we will have to talk about how to make treoglycols as well. But let's put this off for a second. For now, let's have a look at this strange limitation Mattison and Peterson ran into. What could be the reason for the fact that the fourth homologation did not work, although the first three went reasonably well? In their paper, Mattison and Peterson mention elimination reactions and in later works also discuss debenzylation as a side reaction in this and in similar systems. A reasonable explanation for this is the formation of an intramolecular complex in which the boron atom and the oxygen atom of the first benzyl ether form a six-membered 8 complex. And remember, we are in a race here. And blocking the boron atom from nucleophilic attacks slows down the formation of the 8 complex. And this is necessary for homologation. So, by slowing down this 8 complex formation, we give the carbonoid time to decompose by alpha elimination or do something else, like for example attacking this activated benzyl ether here. Mattison and Peterson found that the use of lithiated dibromomethane with this compound led to intractable mixtures, while lithiated dichloromethane at least allowed for the indirect detection of some product traces. They were, however, able to homologate the product with lithiated chloromethane. This fits quite well with our explanation, as softer and bigger nucleophiles will have a harder time attacking the heavily shielded boron atom, while the smaller and harder lithiated chloromethane might wiggle its way past the pinane scaffold. This allowed Mattison and Peterson to introduce a fifth carbon atom but not a new stereocenter. Thus, they finished their synthesis by preparing ribose after oxidation and deprotection. Ribose is an aldopentose. 
Unfortunately, most biological relevant sugar are hexoses. So we would need one more homologation here. And since Madison obviously decided to go after other interesting stuff with this then newly found reaction, we decided to pick up the challenge from here. But how could we make this work? We learned from Madison that these three homologations and another reaction with a hard nucleophile work reasonably well. Thus our strategy relied on using the three homologation reactions and combining them with a hard vinyl metal species in order to introduce a nucleophilic C2 building block. However, this approach still left us with three key challenges. Firstly, we had to establish control over the three stereocenters introduced by Madison reaction and thus enable the synthesis of both erythro and treoglycols at every stereocenter. Secondly, we had to introduce the fourth stereocenter by an oxidative method and assign it with some confidence and find a way to control it effectively. Thirdly, we had to find a way to make our vinyl metal C2 building block from C1 building blocks. Because we want to have a C1 based synthesis here, so <laughs> introducing a C2 building block would be cheating. Let's start by having a look at our synthesis of Alitol, in which all glycos are in an erythro configuration. To allow for addressing the different hydroxyl groups individually, we started with a silide protected C1 building block. Homologation and substitution with paramethoxy benzoxide introduced a second carbon atom with a PMB protected hydroxyl group. Another homologation and substitution with benzyl alkoxide gave us this C3 building block. And after the third homologation, we also chose to introduce another benzyl group. Now, there are other alkoxides out there that could have been used here. However, we went with the second benzyl group for reasons of stereochemical assignment, which we will discuss a bit later. For now, we are facing the challenging part. For connecting our C2 building block with our C4 building block, we used vinyl magnesium bromide and the so-called Zweifel olefination. This is not that unsimilar to the Madison homolocation, as it involves formation of an aid complex and after addition of iodine to this electron-rich olefin, a 1-2 migration. After that you end up with a beta haloboronate and those undergo very rapid elimination reactions and this gave us the desired olefination product. This reaction did require a bit of optimization but we got it to work and a sharpless bisadroxylation later we got our hands on a sugar alcohol in which only two easily distinguishable alcohol functionalities are unprotected. But what looks easy and straightforward on paper did take some time to develop in the lab. And one crucial factor was the silide protecting group on the first carbon atom. We thought that a bulky silide group would actually help with the nucleophilic attack on the C4 building block and thus using TBS or even TBDPS sounded like a really good idea to us. However, those did not even allow for the third homologation sequence to work properly. Or, to be a bit more precise, the Madison homologation worked, but the subsequent substitution led to a complete mess. And this becomes quite clear if you look at the homologation product. As we can see, we can again draw a six-membered egg complex. But this time the oxygen boron bond activates the silyl ether for nucleophilic attack and we know that alkoxide nucleophiles really like to do this. So the TBS and the TBDPS ethers turned out to be nothing more than hugely expensive silylation reagents. But by shielding the silicon atom with the three bulky isopropyl groups in tips, this undesired side reaction was suppressed and thus allowed us to finish our alital synthesis. And this alital synthesis showed that our strategy could work. But as the name alitol already suggests, we have built a sugar here in which all hydroxyl groups are in an erythro configuration. So the next challenge was to find a way in which we could use the Madison chemistry to make treoglycols. For that we start with a C1 building block 
containing an SS ditched auxiliary. Ditched, which stands for dicyclohexyl ethane diol, is another classic chiral director for Mattison homologations. And with it, the first homologation substitution sequence worked in a very similar manner to the pinene diol route. The advantage of using ditched here comes from the fact that the corresponding boronic ester is less thermodynamically stable than a pinene diol boronic ester. This is because transesterification leads to an increase in entropy as the fixed diol is replaced with a diol that has additional rotational freedom. For our synthesis, this means that transesterification can be done very easily just by stirring our ditched boronic ester with pinene diol in ether. And since now we have a different chiral director on the boronate, another homologation will lead to the treo product. Unfortunately, this transesterification trick can be done only once, because thermodynamically speaking, you're walking downhill here. Thus, once this trick has been pulled, you can't do it again. So for the next stereo center, we had to use a different strategy, in which the homologation is followed by a reaction with the vinyl Grignard and subsequent oxidation to an allylic alcohol. This reaction was surprisingly difficult and was plagued by competing elimination reactions. But, as we all know from our undergraduate chemistry, higher temperatures favor elimination reactions. So if we want to avoid them, we have to lower our temperature. So with a strict temperature regime for both substitution and oxidation, we got our hands on the allyl alcohol and after benzylation on the trio trio C6 building block. So let's take a step back and compare the installation of this second trio glycol to the earlier strategy for a moment. In it, substitution with sodium benzoxide turned the bromide into a mast hydroxyl group under inversion. After that, the Zweifel olefination introduced the vinyl group by replacing the carbon boron bond with a carbon carbon bond. In the second strategy, vinyl Grignard substituted the bromide under inversion and oxidation turned the carbon boron bond into a carbon oxygen bond. So, by choosing the appropriate vinylation procedure, we can now decide whether we want to have a trio or a retroglycol motif at this position. We finished the sequence again by a sharpest beside oxylation, and for that we had to use the pseudoenzymeric ligand, which gave us a differentially protected L-glucitol. Now, obviously, it is possible to mix these two strategies and get our hands on other sugar alcohols. So, if we take the erythro C3 building block from the allotol synthesis and apply the vinylation by substitution strategy from a minute ago, we end up with an erythro trio oxidation product. In a perfect world, this would mean that by choosing the appropriate ligand for our Sharpless oxidation, all sugar alcohols would now be available. <laughs> Unfortunately, we don't live in this perfect world. Since we are working with alpha chiral olefins here, a certain amount of substrate control has to be expected. Just looking at the results, we immediately see that substrate control is much stronger than ligand control. So, how could this be the case? If you remember your Claydon, you will know that the Hauk model can be used to predict the outcome of these reactions. For drawing the low energy configuration, we place the allylic CH bond synperiplanar to the olefin. In order to attack the olefin efficiently, osmium tetroxide is activated by our chiral ligand. Now we can decide whether we expect the negatively charged oxygen atom to come from the top, where it would have to interact with a larger polyol, or from the bottom, where it would have to get past the free electron pairs of the allylic oxygen atom. It seems likely that this repulsive effect would favor attack from the top of the olefin. And this would lead to an erythro configuration. But how can we be sure here? We therefore decided to convert what we thought would be our L-mannitol derivative into this somewhat simpler acetal. Since you can buy natural D-mannitol diacetal, all we needed to do is to convert it and then compare the resulting NMR to the mannose derivative we thought we made. 
And what shall I say? The NMRs matched perfectly. But how do we get our hands on the Treo product? Well, fortunately, it is quite easy to discriminate between the primary and the secondary alcohol. So we could protect the first and activate the latter. By cleaving the ester, we released an alkoxide, which in turn closed the epoxide under inversion. While one could think about opening this epoxide again, this might not be very useful. Because if you compare this compound to the product that Sharpless made by pain rearrangement, you can see that we already made a quite good sugar precursor. But talking about finishing sugars, usually we end up with a dio. And from there we have two options to finish our sugar molecule. We can either protect the dial as an acetal and desilylate the first carbon atom. After we oxidize it, the acetal falls off and we close the pyranose one way. We can also close it the other way around if we differentially protect the dial and oxidize the sixth carbon atom and thus close the pyranose the other way. Now, due to the C2 symmetry of mannitol, both of these methods give us a differentially masked mannose. But if you think about isotopic labeling, there is actually quite an important difference here. The three atoms highlighted in both compounds have been introduced in the final Madison home location vinylation sequence. Since isotopic labeling starting materials are quite expensive, you want to introduce them as late in the synthesis as possible. Thus, being able to choose between those two strategies allows you, for example, to place the carbon atom introduced by the last Madison homologation either at C3 or C4. But how can we address C1, C2, C5 and C6? Well, for that we need to find a way to make the vinyl metal species from C1 building blocks. We thus started from bispinaculato borylmethane which can also be made from dibromomethane. Alkylation with dibromo or diiodomethane led to a beta haloboronate. And as we already learned in the Zweifelolefination, those are quite notorious for undergoing beta elimination. Since the resulting vinyl pinacol boronic ester is quite volatile, we used the transesterification trick from earlier. Since the corresponding pinane diol species is much more stable and less volatile, column chromatography now was no problem anymore. In order to get a suitable precursor for our vinyl metal species, we decided to replace the boron atom with a halogen. For that, we added sodium methoxide, which generated an aid complex and thus a very electron rich alkene, which could again be electrophilically attacked, for example, by iodine. This delivered a beta haloboronic ester, which underwent beta elimination to vinyl iodide. Bulb to bulb distillation gives you a 1 to 10 mixture of the desired vinyl iodide and diethyl ether. This, however, is not a problem, as the diethyl ether does not interfere in the next reaction. And here we decided to use an iodo-lithium exchange reaction with butyl lithium. This was done since on a small scale it is much more convenient than making a grignard with magnesium metal. Vinyl lithiums are fine for zweifelolefinations. But substitution of alpha haloboronic boronates is facilitated by magnesium bromide, which activates the 1-2 migration. Therefore, we prepared magnesium bromide freshly from magnesium metal and dibromoethane. This also allowed us to use this vinyl metal species for the medicine substitution. You can see that we have everything now that we need for introducing our C1 building blocks anywhere throughout an aldohexose. If you want to learn more about our synthesis, Check out the link in the video description, which will get you straight to the article. Suyen Kiropakaran is the first author on this one, and he has more or less single handedly developed the whole carbohydrate synthesis. Glip Arago, who is still an undergraduate at this point, developed the route to vinyl metal species from C1 reagents and thus provided us with the key to the late stage introduction of isotopic labels. This is something we really plan to exploit in our next project in this area. 
But for now, we want to thank the DFG for funding this project. And of course you for your very kind attention. If you want to learn more about strategies for making heteroatom rich molecules from C1 building blocks, check out the video abstract for our corresponding review on this one. You can find it behind the left link. If you are rather interested in boron-based olefination chemistry, such as the one we used for making the vinyl metal species, check out the video on the right, which will lead you to the somewhat longer video abstract for our review on this chemistry.